Okay, thanks very much for having me. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Yeah. All right, very exciting group we got today. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit everything about beer. I first wanted to say, because I just saw this guy walk in, can I see your shirt, sir, in the back there? Can you stand up? You have a Brugler shirt? <laughs> that is amazing. Okay, so I just want to get that out of the way. <clears throat> uh, so what I'd like to do is really we can make the presentation as technical or as uh, kind of surface level as you'd like. Uh, what I really like to have happen during these talks is uh, for people to ask questions. Uh, and that's what makes it fun and interesting. I mean, I can sit up here and talk at you the entire time, but it's much more fun if we make it interactive. And if you have a question about beer, uh, I'm pretty sure that someone else in the room had that same question or wanted to know the answer for it. So please ask anything that you'd like to know. Uh, and it could be literally anything beer related or, you know, life tips or facial hair or whatever you want. We could talk about all that stuff. All right. So the basics are, we're gonna talk about a little bit about the history of the company, uh, where we kind of came from. I'm gonna touch, I'm gonna kind of sprinkle in the history of beer throughout the presentation as we talk about ingredients, brewing process and things like that. Then we'll move into ingredients. We'll then do a short uh, talk on the brewing process and how those ingredients are used. And then we're gonna talk about um, sort of the mechanics of sensory evaluation and sensory vocabulary. And then we're going to break from the presentation and go drink a bunch of beer and do a live sensory vocabulary training. And it'll be really fun. I'll teach you all how to talk about beer. Uh, how many people have been in the room have uh, felt intimidated at a bar or restaurant before when they're ordering a beer and you don't want to sound dumb or you, you know, don't know how to pronounce the beer, you don't know how to describe the beer to a friend or the server who's asking you about what you want and you go, uh, I don't know, it's, I want it good, right? <laughs> We've all experienced that before. Okay, well, I'm going to make it so you're not like that anymore and you guys are all wizards when you go to the bars and restaurants. Sound cool? All right, I also need way more enthusiasm throughout the presentation, okay? So when I say something next time, you gotta give me a little action, all right? Okay, History Green Flash. So we opened in 2002. Uh, we opened about the summer of 2002. We made very uh, kind of beach-going beers at the time. Uh, made a beer called Extra Pale Ale. We made a Ruby Red Ale. They were all kind of this four to five and a half percent alcohol, uh, easy drinking, beach going beers. We were up in Vista, if uh, you're not familiar, that's about 35 miles north of here, uh, inland off the 15. And we were in a kind of a business park there where you see a lot of the small breweries hanging out. Uh, about two years into our operation, we hired a new brewmaster named Chuck Silva. And at the time, uh, IPAs were just starting to come around and be popular and present in the beer community. And Mike Hinckley, who is our owner, uh, he came up to Chuck and said, hey, I really want to make the quintessential West Coast style IPA, you know, the San Diego IPA that we can really hang our hat on. And then lo and behold, he made a beer called West Coast IPA. And if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's a very popular West Coast style IPA and one of the first of its kind that really helped champion that style that was sort of born in San Diego and Southern California that's been uh, that terminology has been used, you know, throughout the nation, throughout the world, really, uh, about what a West Coast style IPA is. And if you wonder what a West Coast style IPA is, it means just a highly hopped, um, lots of dry hop, which means lots of hop aroma, lots of bitterness, and a very pale malt structure to it, which will, that'll all make sense later. Okay, uh, in 2007, we launched a beer called La Frique, which was our first, the first uh, American Belgian style IPA that was inspired by Hublon Schuf uh, from Brasserie de Schuf. And that's been one of our most award-winning beers. We're actually gonna taste that beer today, which is awesome, very excited for you. There we go. <laughs> See, this is, uh, we got something going here. I like this, guys. Uh, in 2011, we moved from Vista down to where we're at right now, right down the street from you guys. We knew that there would be a Google facility here eventually, <laughs> and uh, we thought we'd uh, move down there. So we started brewing, uh, at Vista, we were brewing about 13,000 barrels a year, and when you think of a barrel, it's actually two kegs, so it's 31 gallons. So the biggest keg that you can get is a 15.5 gallon keg, 
otherwise known as a half barrel. Uh, when you hear people talk about the production of beer at a, a major brewery, they talk about it in barrels, which would just be double that. So uh, 31 gallons. So we made about 26,000 kegs or 13,000 barrels at the old facility. We distributed to about 15 states or so. Uh, now, we are uh, at the pace of about 100,000 barrels or so, so significantly more from where we we're at. Right when we moved into the building, we immediately started brewing at about a 40,000 barrel a year pace. So going from 13 to 40, obviously, that's a huge pain in the ass, and uh, it was very difficult. But we did it, and now we have a cool tasting room and a fun place to go visit, so come see us. Uh, 2014, we bought a brewery that opened the same year that we did in 2002 called Alpine Beer Company. They were known for making and still are known for making super awesome, delicious IPAs, uh, especially Nelson and Duet. And we're going to have one of them today called Windows Up, which is kind of a variant on Duet. So for the people that like hoppy beers, you're going to be very excited about that if you haven't had it. In 2015, we opened up our barrel aging facility, which is called Cellar 3. Uh, Cellar 3 is in Poway. It's about a 20 minute drive east of here, up one exit off of Scripps Poway Parkway, uh, right by the Costco. Apparently people like Costco. I always have to describe it that way. I'm like, yeah, we're, uh, you know, you get about four and a half miles up east on Scripps Poway, and they're like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's right off of there, you know? It's like, there's a Costco across the street. Oh, the Costco, <laughs> of course. So, uh, <laughs> we, uh, I love that facility personally, on a, on a personal note. We use it as a, a rotating art gallery as well, and there's probably about 12 to 15 barrel-aged beers on draft all the time, which, you know, is impossible to find anywhere, and it's very, very cool. Uh, in 2016, we opened up a place in Virginia Beach, Virginia, uh, which is awesome. We did that for shipping purposes, so now we have a brewery on each coast that can ship anywhere that they need to ship. And we also opened a super giant tasting room there. The beer garden is actually the size of our entire building over here, so it's massive. It holds like 3,000 people and a really fun place to visit. So if you're ever out on the opposite coast and you want to go check it out, you got a little home away from home uh, and green flash out there. And uh, in 2018, uh, coming up very soon, uh, we're going to open a place in Lincoln, Nebraska. So we bought an old uh, defunct brew pub out there, and I'm working on the construction right now and just hired a chef, and we'll get our final inspection later this month, and hopefully we'll get going. So if you're ever in the middle of the country and you want to pop by and need a home away from home, we've got you covered there, too. All right. Any questions on uh, Green Flash stuff? No? Yes. The brew, the Brugel guy. Why Lincoln, Nebraska? Lincoln, Nebraska. Why Lincoln, Nebraska? Um, I could say why anywhere and answer it the same way, which would be that um, we want to be at a local or regional brewery to as many people as we can moving forward. So uh, we feel like there are so many great breweries in so many towns nowadays, now that people are learning how to make awesome beer, that it's less of a draw to buy national beer when you have a bunch of great breweries around your town. Uh, and Lincoln is a, um, you know, it's a college town, uh, University of Nebraska is there, and it's also a growing building beer community, so we really like those emerging beer communities where hopefully we can get in early and be a part of the community and integrate ourselves, so uh, same thing with any other kind of, of those types of areas that we want to be a part of. Yeah. Anything else? Do you brew uh, the full lineup at both locations? At uh, Virginia or San Diego? Yeah. We do, yes. Yeah, so. Oh, uh, sorry. The question was, do we brew um, all the full lineup at both locations? So the way that we decide on the brew schedule is just really based on demand. So if we have orders, if we have a bunch of orders on the East Coast, uh, we'll most likely brew them out of Virginia and ship them out of Virginia, and then the same goes with the West Coast. And we have, we do see a difference in the mix out there. Uh, if you take the tasting room alone, uh, for here we have a bunch of IPAs at the top of our list, and on the East Coast we have a bunch of the darker beers and pale ales and things like that. So it's definitely a different uh, audience out there that we see. So th the mix of the production is slightly different because of that. Yes? It affects it significantly. Uh, that's a great question. The question was, sorry, Adam, <laughs> keep getting yelled at to repeat the question. I'm repeating it. 
the question was, how much does the water chemistry affect the flavor of the beer? And the answer is significantly. Um, the minerality in the water changes a lot of, um, it really changes kind of, it, it's not a great term for it, but I would say the softness of the beer. Uh, the, the way that the hops from a bitterness standpoint, an acid standpoint, interact with the minerals in the water uh, really affects the kind of overall bitterness and sort of mouth pe mouthfeel profile there. So the water is very soft over there, and it is very hard over here. And it's, it's also a little bit more difficult over here, too, because we have several different water sources over here. So it's hard to say what the minerality looks like in our water profile. It's, it's very inconsistent. So we try our best to level it out with stripping out some of those minerals and making it consistent. Um, but the reality is if we had our choice, I'm sure we would select to make the water profile just like the one in Virginia because we really like brewing with, with that stuff. But that would be triple reverse osmosis over here. It'd be a huge capital investment to do. But it's something that we do want to do. Yeah. Any other, other questions? So the, yes. So the softer water softens the hops? Or? Correct. Yeah. It's not as uh, harsh of a bitterness, if you will, with, uh, with the softer water. Easy. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will learn to repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. Okay. Moving right along. Uh, let's talk about ingredients here. So I brought some ingredients along with me. Uh, beer is made out of four main ingredients, barley, hops, water, and yeast. Uh, so I brought some barley. We'll talk about that first. I'm going to go ahead and pass that around the room. Here it is for everybody to see on the camera. Okay, the barley that you have in front of you, uh, when you see it, is a two-row pale malt. Uh, and that has lots of terminology in there that I will uh, break down for you. But basically, uh, barley is grown in two different types. There's two row and six row. And two row, the basic difference besides the physical structure of the, the barley stock itself, is that two row kernels, uh, barley kernels, are a little more plumper and have a little more starch content to them, and epso facto, a little more sugar content to them than six row kernels. Craft breweries widely use two row barley uh, rather than six row barley. Six row is used by the macro breweries mostly. So you'll see Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors and stuff like that mostly using six row, as well as they use some adjuncts as uh, sugar ad additions that most craft breweries do not. So the basic mechanics of malted barley is that, well, first of all, to get to the malting process is very important. So you grow the barley, and then you have to send it off to the malting facility. And this was, uh, I went to the Simpsons malting facility right outside of uh, London, about three hours outside of London, uh, and they've been around for decades and decades and decades. The guys who showed us around the facility have both been there for 30 years, which is amazing. So they've been malting barley forever. Uh, so basically, you're going to grow the barley, and then you hydrate it uh, in a giant vessel, fill it full of water, hydrate it up. Then you put it into a vessel called the GKV, which is the germinating kilning vessel. So think about when you're in school, and you put a little seed in your paper towel and watered it down, and you let it sprout. And as it started to sprout, it was turning into a plant, right? Well, that's the end of the germination process as far as malted barley is concerned. So they stop the germination process by heating it up, and that's the kilning portion of malting the barley. And from there, you have malted barley. So that is what you see right there is the lightest malting of a malted barley that you will get most of the time. It's called two-row pale malt. Pale is in the reference to the color, and two rows because it's two-row, right? Um, after that, the way that you heat the barley is going to change not only the sugar content, uh, but it's also going to change the color of it. So we've all seen different colored beers out there from you know, deep black to very pale and strong color, right? And those colors come from the different malt that they put inside of the beer. Now, how much they put inside of the beer, how much of that malt or what color it is, is totally up to the brewers. And um, I will kind of dispel some myths around the colors of beer in it later on. Uh, but basically, this malted barley is our sugar content. 
So by having this special malting process, we end up with this enzyme inside of the malted barley kernel that can convert its own starches into fermentable sugars. It's extremely important. So all you have to do is add a little bit of hot water to it, and then you have sugar water. You have fermentable sugar water afterwards, which is amazing. It also has a lot of historical implications because when we switched from a society of hunters and gatherers to more of an agricultural society, uh, we used barley for lots of different things like porridge and making bread and things like that. And as they were out harvesting this barley, one time it rained and it began the germination process. So the barley had basically malted itself or it started the germination itself. And then when they dumped it into the bowl to make uh, porridge, they ended up with malted barley that s sparked this enzymatic reaction. And there's wild yeast around us all the time. So this wild yeast and bacteria in the air went in and fermented this fermentable beverage that was sitting in the pot and started foaming over and they had beer. It made beer. And then someone crazy decided to put a, you know, like some reed straw in there and drink it and felt funny afterwards and then beer was born. That was it. So that was about 10,000 years ago in ancient Africa. And that's the most detailed version of uh, the history of beer that you could possibly get into. So after this, the different amounts that we heat it, again, affect the color and the flavor of the beer. Uh, they basically affect the uh, fermentable sugar content that you're gonna have in there, and then what kind of flavors that you're gonna get. So it, think about if you, uh, how many people cook at home? Okay, not like microwaving grilled cheese, like you actually cook. Okay, so if you cut up an onion and you throw it into a pan, you're starting a caramelization process usually, right? So the natural sugars inside of that onion are gonna come out to the outside. We've all had caramelized onions before. And what happens is when you do it for a little bit in the pan, you get a little browning on the edges. You get a little caramely characteristic to the onion. If you do it for a long time, you end up with a deep, tan, rich onion with lots of sugar and lots of caramely qualities to it, right? It's the same kind of thing with malted barley. So you can caramelize malted barley very lightly, and you can have, uh, it's called crystal malt, and it has a wide range of numbers, which is a, love a bond scale that says how dark they are. So a C15 malt would be something that you'd see in a normal IPA or pale ale. Means that it's 15 degrees love a bond. Means it's very light in color. Uh, and then all the way to C143, that's gonna be that deep, rich, caramelized onion kind of characteristic. And that's something that you'd see in like an imperial red ale or you know a deep amber, copper kind of colored ale. And it's gonna have more sugar content. Also, the longer that you heat it, the less starch content that you get. So then you end up with a lower alcohol beer. So a lot of times people think that darker beers are stronger than lighter beers, right? You've probably all seen that before, heard that before. Maybe you still think that right now. It's totally untrue, okay? And the reason why is because the amount of malt that you use is directly responsible with the sugar content, which is directly responsible for the alcohol content that you have. So for example, if I were to make an imperial stout and I were to use this glass right here, I would probably fill it up to about here with two row pale malt that you see walking around the room there and then about that much of roasted malt. And that's it because roasted malt does not provide a lot of alcohol content, but it provides a nice dark color to it and a little bit of a roasty quality because it's roasted like a coffee bean would be. And that is what makes the alcohol so high, is using a bunch of that light malt. So if I were to take one glass full of light malt and one glass full of roasted malt that was burnt to hell, that light malt would be a very strong beer and the dark malt would be extremely bitter and not very strong. Uh, for example, Guinness, right? That's very dark beer. That's 4% alcohol, okay? Very light in alcohol. So don't judge a book, uh, don't judge a beer by its color. How about that? Book by its cover, beer by its color. Uh, very important. Any other questions on malt before we move on? Great. Okay, here's hops. Hops are the, the popular uh, exciting ingredient, right? So I brought some hops for you guys to check out. Uh, but before I send those around, what I wanted to talk about is kind of where they come from. So they're grown mostly in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Yakima Valley, Washington does an enormous percentage of all the hops that we get in America. Uh, they're also grown in Europe, uh, Germany, Czech Republic, um, the UK, and then they grow some in the Southern Hemisphere that are more similar to what we grow in the Pacific Northwest, like Australia and New Zealand. 
Uh, hops have a couple different uh, really interesting components to them. Uh, one is that they have antimicrobial and antibacterial qualities to them. And the other is that they have these acids and oils that get extracted during different parts of the brewing process that can provide different flavors and aromas and mouthfeels and all kinds of different qualities. And most of the time when people think of hops, they think of what, what word do you think of? You think of like a hoppy beer. What do you guys think of? Huh? Bitter. bitter. Right. You think of bitter. But it's actually not true at all. Their hops are used for a wide array of flavoring and sometimes used just for preservative qualities and it has nothing to do with bitterness whatsoever. Uh, and we'll get into that. So hops are grown on things called vines. They're like vines except for hops. And they grow about 15 or 20 feet in the air. And these vines, which you can see right here, this is after they've been chopped down, they get harvested about once a year, one time a year. Uh, usually there's an early harvest and a late harvest. And it's later in the year, usually around the October, September, October range. And what they do is they come in with a thing called a bottom cutter. And they chop the bottoms of all the vines off. And then they come in with a thing called a top cutter, crazy. Uh, and they chop all the tops of the vines off. They put them in the back of a truck. And then they send them off to a sorting facility. And the sorting facility is going to try to get all of the cones off of the hop. So you guys have ever seen a hop cone before? Um, let me fast forward here. This is what hop cones look like. That happens to be me smelling them as well. But you can see that there's a whole array of hop cones. This is after this vine has been mulched up. This is at the same hop farm. Uh, which is called Siegel Ranch in uh, Yakima Valley, Washington. And these hop vines will get stripped away, and they all kind of do it different ways. But the idea is we just want the cones. They're going to take everything else and turn it into mulch. So once they get these cones out of there, they're going to send them off to a kilning facility where they're going to dry out the water, any remaining water that's left in these cones. And then they're going to send them off to a baling area. And they're going to bale them up into giant 100-pound bales or so. After that, most of the hops that are used at commercial breweries are in pellet form. So they send off these dehydrated flowers to these pelletizing facilities that grind it up into a powder, shoot it out of a dye, and then it ends up like this rabbit food that I got in this glass right here. So I'm going to pass this around. What I'd like you to do, you'll make a, a tiny bit of mess, but I'm sure you guys have some vacuums. Uh, if you pull out one of the little rabbit pellets in there, and you smash it up real good, and then you smell it. That is called volatizing the oils. And like I mentioned earlier, there's two really important parts of the hops which come from one part of the uh, sort of anatomy of the hop, which is called the lupulin gland. So have you ever heard hoppy beers that reference uh, lupulin or lupulus or things like that? That's all because of the hop. Inside of the hop has a gland called the lupulin gland, and it's this waxy yellow substance that houses two important parts called the resins and the essential oils. So in its most basic term, the resins are what create the bitterness in beer, and they're judged on a scale called alpha acid. So it's about a scale from zero to 20. So you had a 20% alpha acid hop, and you use all 20% alpha acid hops in the boiling part, you'd end up with a really bitter beer afterwards. If you didn't use any of that in the boiling part, you would end up with no bitterness in your beer, basically. So it's very tricky to when people talk about, uh, when people use the word, before I continue, my least favorite word in the beer industry is hoppy. I just thought I'd let you know. So if you say hoppy, we might fight later. <laughs> so don't say hoppy. And you'll learn more of why I don't want you to say hoppy right now and also a lot more when we do the sensory evaluation because it's like saying uh, a beer is wet or alcoholic because it all has hops in it. It all is hoppy to some degree or another. It just depends on how many hops they use, when they used them, what types of hops they use, what were the statistics of those hops they use. So it's this very broad, really crappy term that doesn't describe anything that has to do with beer. Okay, so stop saying hoppy for the rest of your lives. All right, <laughs> moving on from that. Uh, when there's the other part is the essential oils. The essential oils are what you're smelling right now. So when you crush up that hop uh, pellet there 
and smell it, that's because we smash the oils inside of there and they all released into the air. That's called volatizing the oils. So if you ever go to a cool cocktail bar and you get an old fashioned or something with a little rind of you know orange or lemon or whatever on it, and you see them squeeze the rind on there and twist it around the rim of your glass, you guys seen that before? That's what they're doing. They're doing the same thing that we're doing right now. It's volatizing the oils. There's a bunch of essential oils inside of the rind of the orange. They squeeze it, it shoots out, and then they put it around the rim of the glass. So as you take a drink, the uh, orange aroma is on the rim of the glass. So that's what we're extracting during the very end of the brewing process. So when you smell an IPA or a hop forward beer in some way, shape, or form, IPA, double IPA, hoppy pale ale, whatever it may be, you put your nose into the glass and you smell all those pine and citrus and grassy and resinous notes, all those fun things, that all comes from that piece of the lupulin glands, the essential oil of the hop. Make sense? Okay, great. There's about uh, 150 or so different commercial hops out there in the world. Um, then there's a whole bunch of experimental hops. Uh, the Peralt Farms are the guys who make mosaic hops for the people who are super beer nerds in the stands there. Uh, and they also run the Hop Breeders, I forget what it's called, Hop Breeders Society, Hop Breeders Union, something like that. And he has maybe 10,000 different varietals of hops growing at their facility. And they want to try to find the next new citra or mosaic, which are all cool, hip, and happening hops, if you don't know what they are. And uh, the, the time that it takes from a hop to go from, let's plant it in the ground, it's this experimental hop, to now it's this commercially viable hop that everybody in the country can buy, can be around eight to 10 years. So it takes an extremely long time, especially if you look at Beer, the craft beer as a whole is kind of in its infancy, right? We're only 25 years old maybe or so that it really started ramping up and really only in the last probably decade it's got very popular and sort of now you see commercials of you know people that want credit cards to open their breweries and stuff like that. Like that shit didn't happen 20 years ago, right? Nobody cared about beer. So pretty crazy. Uh, any questions on hops that we have out there? Yes. What about this area for growing hops? What is your perspective? We do not have a great area for growing. Thank you. So I, okay, now I'm back in the, Hey, Adam, I'm going to repeat the question right now. What do I think about this area for growing hops? What are my thoughts on that? Uh, great question. I think that this is not an awesome area to grow hops. Uh, we do not really have the climate uh, to grow hops. If you actually follow the parallels along uh, both in the northern and southern hemisphere, you'll find that the places where they grow hops all follow kind of the same parallels. So for some reason or another, be it the soil or the amount of light that we have throughout the day, it's just not an awesome area to grow hops. Doesn't mean it can't be done, but probably just not on a massive scale. It's already being done. There are people that grow local hops out in Valley Center and Hamul and things like that. But just to give you an idea, just for us, which we're not that big of a brewery, I mean, at this, the San Diego location, we probably brew you know, 70,000 barrels or something like that. If we wanted one hop for one beer, we would need 40,000 pounds or so of hops to make it a, a national beer. And that's probably like 400 times the amount that they make in San Diego County, you know, and that's just one hop for one beer. So uh, I think that it is like as a fun hobby, you could totally do it and you could probably make some pretty decent hops, but on a massive scale, if you're to open up a giant farm with acres and acres of land, it's probably not the best operation. Yes. What else are hops used for? What else are hops used for was the question. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, great question. What else are hops used for? So uh, previously, they were actually used as a sleep aid. Uh, so they would have hop-filled pillows. Uh, and in the history of beer, they actually weren't used in beer for a long time, uh, up until about the year 1500 was when they started getting used. That's when they were widely adopted. Uh, previously, they used a mixture called gruet, which is like a spice mixture, uh, kind of similar to what you'd get out of a, um, like a Jägermeister or a, uh, 
uh, fernet or something like that, like spruce tips and very herbaceous kind of qualities to it. So I don't think that there's any other real super popular uses for hops other than growing them for decorations or using them in beer in some way, shape, or form. People use them in lots of different ways in beer. Um, I mean, there's some fringy stuff, like people will make air fresheners out of them or chapstick out of them and things like that. But for the most part, that's kind of what they're used for. And, and part of the reason why they're difficult to use for many other things is because they, are, they can be extremely bitter. And especially when they're used, like if you were to eat one of those hops, it would mess up your palate for a couple of days, or maybe just a day. I probably should have told you that before I pass them around, but I mean, it's not gonna, you know, you're not gonna get hurt or anything, but it just makes it so it kind of coats your palate, you won't be able to taste things. And um, so, you know, I mean, I see, see people use them for flavorings and liquor occasionally, hop flavored vodkas and gins and things like that, but that's really about it. I don't know any other commercial uh, uses for them. Uh, okay, the last, the guy with the Brugley shirt. Mm -hmm. The question was, there, this year might have been a difficult year for the hop harvest and the amount of hops that were harvested, and is that going to affect the price of the beer for the end consumer? Um, throughout the years, we have not really seen downward price pressure from the consumer side because of the ingredients, which kind of sucks for us because it's n very... Uh, dissimilar from the wine industry in the sense that when you have a bad year of grapes, you can just say our wine sucked that year because we had a bad year of grapes. But in beer, nobody really thinks of it that way. I mean, all of you guys that drink our beer or any beer for that matter, you expect it to taste exactly the same every time you drink it, right? You don't go buy your favorite IPA or pale ale or sour beer, whatever it is, and go wonder what it's going to be this time. Who knows, right? That doesn't happen. And that is the way that it is with wine, right? You see that thing on the label like, oh, 2002 is better than 2006, is better than 2009 or whatever. We don't really have that opportunity most of the time. So pretty much everyone expects the beer to be the exact same price and have the exact same flavor and aroma and qualities to it no matter what. So they're not really afforded that capability of changing the price point because of the ingredients. You either don't make that beer anymore or you use substitute hops. Uh, that maybe had a better harvest or things like that. Uh, go ahead. So if my friends say the beer is hoppy and I want to say it's cool, do I correct them and say no, it's fabulous? No, you don't. Uh, the question was if my, if my friends say a beer is hoppy and I want to be cool and correct them, do I say something else? Uh, I think that I, I'm a huge proponent of education and educating people, and especially when it comes to things that are, there's, lots of bad information that's out there, which I think the beer industry is one of those things where it's starting to become more prevalent that people know more things, and there's more good information floating around. But for a very long time, we had lots of bad information, and lots of people making up things and acting like, um, you know, sort of uh, authorities on subjects they probably shouldn't have been, which helped the spread of poor information, unfortunately. And then we ended up with things like people calling everything hoppy, right? So uh, if your friend says, um, I think this beer is hoppy, and if they really care and they want to learn more, then you can tell them what you learn at the end of this when we talk about sensory evaluation. Uh, if they don't care, then just don't correct them. <laughs> Save you a friend. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the question was, what are the physical effects of hops compared to alcohol? I don't know if I understand the question. Well, you get drunk if you drink alcohol, but is there any kind of like relaxation? Or? So, the, yes, the question was, is there some sort of physical effect that you can feel from hops? Um, it was, uh, I suppose, pontificated that it could be a relaxant of some nature that it could make you sleepy in some way shape or form and some people do claim that uh, when they drink heavily hot beers they become more relaxed they become more sleepy like I mentioned they used them pillows previously uh, people who work the hot farms they would say that they'd fall asleep so I, I suppose that there's something there but I mean I personally don't notice any effects so I don't know that's all I got what else yes Like 
Yeah, the question was, are there particular hop varietals that are, um, that are sort of out of, you can only get from one grower? And the answer is yes. And it's actually a, a very important part of understanding hop purchasing, uh, because when hops are made, most of the time the hop farm wants to own that hop. So uh, nowadays, everybody has these like name brand hops that they want to make only at their hop farm. You can only get them at their hop farm. They do license out the names and then end up eventually, usually they end up growing them other places and saying, you know, this is Mosaic, but it's trademarked and it came from Peralt Farms originally. And then there was some shakeup a, a while back where like the hop that you guys got to smell is called Columbus at the time. There were several farms growing that same hop, and it was Columbus, it was also Zeus, and it was also Tomahawk. And so there, you could buy Columbus, you could buy Zeus, you could buy Tomahawk, and you could buy CTZ. It's all the same hop. But so that got really messy and really confusing. So we don't see that much anymore, but yeah, there's definitely like trademark issues out there with, with hops. Uh, yes? Yeah, lots of people do it, uh, and it only is usually done with barrel-aged beers most of the time, or beers that have extreme aging properties that are not hop-forward, like an uh, imperial stout or a barley wine or some sort of sour beer, something along those lines. Yeah, we can talk about that more. Okay, anything else on hops? Great. Oh, there's the inside of a hop. That's cool. So this waxy stuff, it's a little hard to see with the projector, but there's little yellow dots all over this. You can kind of see it in this region. That's the lupulin gland that I was talking about. So if you were to take a hop cone and smash it up, it's real sticky and it would have all those little yellow balls uh, kind of around it and that has all the resins and the essential oils. Okay, let's talk about water. We talked about it a little bit about the minerality of water. Um, the important things that I want to note on water is that the mineral content uh, number one, it affects the quality of the beer quite a bit and the qualitative part of the beer and uh, also the, the quantitative part of the beer for in some way, shape or form in regards to the hops and how they interact. Uh, but also that we have to reduce the hell out of the beer to get it to where it needs to be. So we usually use about five times the amount of water that it is uh, equal to liquid. So if I had this bottle of water and I was making beer, I'd need five times the amount of liquid in here to make one glass of beer that was equal to this bottle. So it takes a lot of water to make beer, in other words. And then if you were to do something like reverse osmosis, it takes exponentially more water in order to do that. Um, the other thing to note about water is that the types of um, sort of like the, the regions that have different minerals in their water, like well before we had, uh, we could strip the minerals out of water and adjust the minerals and we had chemistry and science and all these things. The type of water really uh, sort of chose the type of beer that you made. So if you were in Pilsen, for example, you made Pilsner because the water was super soft and it's great for making Pilsners. Uh, if you were on Burton-on-Trent uh, in England, you would make a ESB because the um, gypsum in the water interacts with the hops and makes a really cool characteristic of them. So you still see, especially in the old world countries, those people that have made, um, and especially people that didn't have to go through prohibition was a big thing because we had like a little break in beer making process for 11 years and a lot of other people didn't. Uh, so those people, the water profiles really shaped what styles of beers they made, as well as the temperature, because that really changed whether you use lager or ale yeast, because there's a big difference there. But those are the main qualities of water. And other than that, water's really boring to talk about, so I'm gonna move on, unless you wanna know more about water in some way, shape, or form. Okay, this is what it looks like. If you haven't seen it before? <laughs> All right. Okay, so there's some gypsum. This is kind of what, if you had a commercial brewery, you'd have some pallets of this stuff. You can rip them open, adjust the mineral content uh, inside of your beers, depending on what type of beer that you're making. So let's say you, generally speaking, you want to make a, a light lager. Uh, you would make the water as soft as possible, least mineral content. And if you were making a hop forward beer, you would use uh, lots of minerals in there to interact with hops. Okay. 
Uh, yeast. So I really, yeast I think is very fun and it's also kind of the unsung hero of beer and it's where a lot of the qualities of beer come from. It's uh, maybe a boring topic to the uninitiated, but when you learn of all its magic qualities, you guys will be very excited about yeast. Okay, so there are two different types of yeast out there in the world, and they are what? Ale and lagers. Boom, ales and lagers. That means there's two different types of beer out there in the world. So if you ever thought there was like a million different types of beer, there isn't, there's just two. It's ales and lagers. The difference between the two is that Ale yeast, so they both produce three qualities. I should say that first. They both produce CO2, esters, and alcohol, alcohol right? The thing we all love. Uh, wait, what? Okay. Uh, so these, these three qualities are, um, they flow through both of these uh, types of yeast, but the ester production in ale yeast is very extreme as to where the ester production in lager yeast is almost non-existent. What are esters, you may be wondering? Esters are natural fruity compounds and flavors that come out during the brewing process, and it's really what makes yeast kind of the unsung hero. Besides making all the alcohol in the beer, like I'm sure we probably none of you would drink beer if it didn't have alcohol in it, but Bec besides that, a lot of the flavors and aromas that you get out of beer come from the yeast. And a lot of the specific styles that you like, if they didn't use the yeast that they did, then they wouldn't be that style of beer. So think about it this way. If you were to have a true German Hefeweizen, like from Einger or Francis Connor or something like that, they use a German Weizen yeast. And that has a special kind of clove and banana-like aroma that comes from the yeast only, just from fermentation, those qualities naturally come out. They don't add any bananas to it, they don't add any clove to it, that's all it is. If that beer did not use that type of yeast, it would not be that beer. Same thing goes with Belgian beers. How many people like Belgian beers in the room? Okay, and I'm talking about real Belgian beers like Trappist style beers, Belgian quadruples, triples, doubles, all that kind of stuff. Those types of beers use a special type of yeast strain that has banana quality to it that comes out during the fermentation process. So all the beers that you try in that category are all gonna have, basically speaking, that type of aroma. Without that, it's not that type of beer. So yeast really makes the beer it, what it is without that type of yeast, without that special type of yeast. And you could use a different type of yeast and it would be a totally different beer. If I took the entire recipe for a Belgian style quadruple and I used a uh, English ale yeast on it, let's say, it would not taste anything like a Belgian quadruple. And you would wonder why I made this beer and called it a Belgian quadruple, okay? So very important that we use the correct types of yeast and there's hundreds of different types of yeast out there. So. The ale yeast works from about 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and lager yeast works from about 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And lager yeast, a lot of times people think that lagers, what, what do you think of when I say lager? Budweiser. Yeah, you think, you think of mostly like lighter, easy drinking, American adjunct lagers, Bud, Miller Coors, right? Things like that. But the reality of the situation is you can use whatever type of yeast that you want in whatever type of beer that you want. So if I made this crazy imperial stout and I wanted to put a lager yeast on it instead of an ale yeast, I could totally do that. And it'd be a very strong and aggressive dark beer, but it would just not have the same esters that the ale yeast would have. So like a Baltic Porter is a great example. Baltic Porter is about a eight to 10% Imperial Porter, black in color, but it uses lager yeast. So a little bit different, right? Different kind of aromatic qualities because of it. So don't, uh, don't kind of uh, write off lagers because they're lagers and don't write off beers because of their color, okay? There's two things to walk away with this from. Any questions on yeast? Oh, you know what else I should say? Sorry, uh, that the amount of time that it takes to ferment the product. So for ale yeast, it takes about one week to ferment out a product from start to finish. And for lager yeast, it takes about a month and a half. So significantly different time because of the different operating temperatures. Uh, what was your question? Uh, does White Lab still do that tasting thing where they do the same recipe, different yeast, and you actually put it in the product? So the question was, does White Lab still do a uh, tasting panel with different 
uh, worts that they put different yeast on? And I believe the answer is yes. White Labs, if you don't know, is a yeast facility that's up off of Miramar Road, fairly close to us. Uh, if you're in San Diego, so head out there, check it out, it's really cool. Um, wort is basically the beer that hasn't had yeast on it yet and hasn't turned into beer. So they'll make one type of wort, like let's say a pale ale wort, and they'll put a German bison yeast on it and a Trappist Belgian style yeast on it and an English ale yeast on it and American yeast on it. And that way you can see what those different qualities are that I'm talking about in regards to ester. It's actually a really cool little science experiment. Okay, any other questions on yeast? Yes. I've heard that uh, White Labs produces, I guess, and sells the majority of brewer's yeast that's used for craft brewing. Is that true? The question was, does White Labs produce the majority of yeast that's used for craft breweries? Um, I don't know. There's also Y yeast and there's also Omega, and they both make quality products that are used. I think that maybe on the West Coast, White Labs is used more. I think Omega and Y yeast are used more on the East Coast, and we're starting to see people switch over to those, especially for barrel-aged beers and sour beers and things like that. Um, I think for American ale yeast and California ale yeast and stuff like that, you'll still see a lot of White Labs uh, canisters and breweries. Okay, what else? Anything else? <laughs> That's actually a good question. What's the scale of the yeast purchases for 50 barrels? Um, so what we do and what most breweries will do will actually be to buy a pitchable batch for a much smaller batch and then we'll propagate it up to build it up to a bigger batch. So we usually brew 250 barrel tanks or 500 kegs at a time. Uh, we Our brew house is 50 barrels, so we brew five times into the fermenter. But what we'll do is divert an amount of wort, usually about 100 barrels, 80 to 100 barrels, into a smaller fermenter. We'll pitch that yeast in there, let it build up to a 100 barrel batch, and then we can pitch it into the 250 after that. And we can reuse it for about 10 generations. It still has the amount of cells that we need to reuse it for that amount of time. After that, it starts mutating and do it doesn't have the quality qualities that we want to anymore, so we have to toss it out, but pretty cool. We can use it a bunch of times. Any more questions? Okay. Oh, that's what yeast looks like. Little fluffy balls of joy. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the brewing process. So, one slide here. So, all of the ingredients that you learned, we'll talk about how to use them real quick. So, in the top right corner there, you'll see the mill. So what we do is we take all that malted barley, whatever we're gonna use to make the beer, be it all two row pale malt or a mixture of 10 different malts, whatever we wanna do, we grind it all up in a mill. So the way that you see that bag that came around, that is how the malt comes to us basically. And then we put it inside of this mill that grinds it up and cracks into the kernels for us. And the reason why is so we can access those starches much more easily and the enzymes that are inside of it. So we crack it up, we get it inside of the first vessel, which is called the mash mixer. So if you're in a smaller homebrew kind of operation or a smaller brewery, you'll have a mash, uh, a, like a mash louder combo, where you'll see something called a mash ton. Uh, in a larger, more uh, commercial brewery, you'll see that those two tanks separated. So at our brewery, this is what it looks like. The mash mixer is the tank where you spark the enzymatic reaction. So you dump all the malted barley in there, you hit it with your hot water, you spin it around. This is, if you were making it at home, you do it on a big pot on the stove and you just churn it around with a spoon. That's all you'd have to do. And that's the mash mixer part of it, right? After that, we're gonna take everything inside of that tank and put it into the louder ton. The louder ton is the tank where we're going to extract the malted barley out of it because we don't need it anymore. We only need it for that very first step in order to get all of the fermentable sugars out of it and all the colors that we wanted out of it. So we do a couple different things in the louder ton. Those little dots on the bottom of it, those actually represent a false bottom. So it has a, a bunch of uh, actually slots through it and grates over the top and that allows the liquid to seep through the bottom of the tank and the grain will stay on the top of the tank. And then at the same time, we will do what's called sparging. Sparge means to rinse. And we are gonna rinse off each of those barley kernels. We're also gonna be adding water so we can reduce it later on, right? We get those reduction of flavors going. So we add a bunch of water in there. We rinse off all those kernels so we can get every little piece of sugar that we possibly can off there. And then it heads over to a boil kettle after that. 
There's a couple different ways to boil. You can either use direct fire. That's what you use if you were at home and you have a little jet burner, kind of a uh, little, you know, kind of stand burner that you put the pot on. Uh, at a commercial brewery, most of the time you use steam. So our, that little unit inside that has the number three on it, that's called a calandria. And inside of that calandria is a series of about 100 tubes, and they're all heated by steam. And what happens is the wort sucks in through the bottom of that calandria and kind of gets flash boiled by each of those metal tubes, and then it hits that top hat and boils out onto itself. So it constantly goes up through the middle and boils out to the outside. And that way we can get a nice, even, rolling boil going. You know when you're making pasta at home and it starts bubbling and really going? That's a rolling boil. So we want to get that going. It's very important to get that going for three different reasons. One is we're going to sanitize the beer. Very important so we don't die that we drink the beer that is sanitized. It's also why uh, a big reason historically why we're all still alive today. Uh, it's also why the Mayflower landed where it did. So it was very important back in the day that you had beer on your adventures. And part of the reason was because the water was filled with dysentery and other bacteria contamination. So if you had water and that was the only thing you had to drink, you died. And if you had beer, they didn't know it at the time, but it was sanitized through the boiling process and because of the yeast that was in there creating alcohol and things like that. So everybody drank beer because you drink beer, you live, you drink water, you die. So it was a very easy <laughs> proposition, right? So most of the time, the beer back then, what we think of as the beer now is a very like social structure to it, right? We go out to the bars, we go to the tasting rooms, we hang out with our friends, we geek out, we yell at our friends for using hoppy, things like that, right? But back then, it was 2%, 2.5%. The kids drank it, parents drank it, everybody drank it because it had vitamins, minerals, and sustenance, and it didn't kill you, right? Very important part. So we boil it so we don't die, first of all, sanitize it. The second part is so we can get a reduction of the flavors, which we talked about, just like you're making a nice uh, wine sauce on your uh, stove at home. We want to reduce the flavors so we can intensify them. Same idea that we're doing. And then the third reason is because we want to interact with these hops. So when we put the hops in right at the beginning, uh, you're going to get the part of the lupulin gland that has the resins in it is going to be extracted. They're isomerized in boiling liquid or they become water soluble. So that breaks down the acids and the hops and it returns bitterness. So if you wanna make a super bitter beer, then you add a bunch of high alpha acid hops at the very beginning of the boil and you end up with a lot of bitterness. If you don't want as much bitterness, then you can do two things. You can either use a hop that has a lot lower alpha acid, a lot lower level of bitterness, maybe four or 5% alpha acid instead of 20, and you can dump them in then, or you can just not do a first hop addition and do them later on in the boil. Because the less time that the hops have to break down in this rolling boil, the less of the acids that they're going to extract. The tricky part about the boil though, is that the essential oils are extremely delicate. So all those beautiful flavors and aromas that come out from the essential oils that we got to smell earlier, those will get boiled off really quickly when you use them in the first part or for the majority of the boil. Uh, when you're home brewing and things like that, you'll hear a lot of terms like late addition hops. That means that you do it at the very end of the boiling process. That way you get the most essential oil extraction that you can, you get the most aroma that you can. After that, we do another step called the whirlpool. In the whirlpool, the wort will shoot in at an angle and spin around in a circle just like a whirlpool. Before that happens, especially if we're making a hop forward beer, we're going to put a big bed of hops inside of that whirlpool and it's gonna spin around and pick up all those hops throughout. And it's gonna create some nice flavor, some nice aroma. We'll get a little color pickup from it spinning around. We're not actively boiling during this Part. It's in the low 200 degree Fahrenheit range. And then we're gonna get rid of it from there. So this is called the hot side or the brew house. A lot of people, a lot of people think that the fermentation area is the brew house, but this is all called the hot side or the brew house. It's where all the stuff on your stove at home would happen basically. After that, we're gonna move all the wort into the cellar. The cellar is where the magic happens. That's where the yeast gets introduced. That's where beer becomes beer. Because all the brewers do is make hoppy sugar water, and then the yeast makes beer. Very important to remember. Whenever brewers are feeling high and mighty, just tell them that, and they get real sad real quick, okay? Uh, so 
The last thing is that little grate at the bottom of the Whirlpool is a heat exchanger. So we want to make the 210, 212 degree hoppy sugar water, 72 degree hoppy sugar water, so we can ferment it over on the other side. We don't have mass genocide of our yeast when we go put it over there. Because we put 200 degree wort inside of this fermenter with a bunch of yeast, they'd all die and be real sad. So we don't want that. We put it over there and we get it to 72 degrees very rapidly. It takes uh, just a couple of minutes to get it down that quickly. And then when we get it inside of the fermenter, we dump the yeast inside of there and we let it go crazy. Very important that there's little oxygen pickup uh, during this process. And once the yeast starts working, it's gonna start creating all those byproducts that we talked about. And then you end up with beer afterwards. Um, there are some more steps that we could go we could talk forever and ever about, but basically after that, you're going to dry hop it is the most important one that I want to talk about since hop forward beers are very popular in Southern California, especially. Uh, and dry hopping means you, it's very confusing because there's nothing dry about it, but you're basically taking a bunch of hops at the very end after the beer has been fermented, it's ready to roll, it could head over to the filtration area if you wanted it to, but instead you throw a whole bunch of hops in there. And the reason why is so we can get the other part of the hop out, the essential oil out. And this is where the majority, the large majority of all the hop aroma that you smell in a hop forward beer is gonna come from, the dry hop. So post-fermentation hopping. Dump a bunch of hops in there, you get all those beautiful aromas just like you guys got to smell earlier. After that, we are going to take the beer into the filtration area, and here you can do all kinds of different features to filter the beer. You, we can put it through a centrifuge, which is just a light filtration to it, a machine that spins around really quickly and takes out any major solids. We can also send it through a plate and frame filter, which is charged with diatomaceous earth, which are made up of little ground up diatomes that help trap spent yeast and other protein bonds. To, and what that means in basic terminology is that it makes the beer clearer because protein bonds uh, proteins that bond together is what makes beer cloudy in its most basic term. So if you have a very highly hot beer or lots of yeast residue or things like that, that's what makes a beer cloudy. And by sending it through this diatomaceous earth filter, it strips those out. Some people think that it strips out some flavor, and that's definitely true. Some flavor and aroma, that's definitely true. Uh, but there's also a, a shelf life and a stability advantage to stripping your beer down very clear. It doesn't mean that it has to be, some beers have just less stuff going on in them and you can send it just through the centrifuge and end up with a fairly clear beer that doesn't go through a heavy polish and some beer ne needs to really go through that heavy polish. It also depends on the style of the beer. Some beers are meant to be very cloudy in appearance and some beers should look bright and clear. That's just the way that it is. Okay, yes. Is that where the body of the beer comes from? Because there's some beers that typically light, others are kind of heavier, denser almost. The question was, is that where the body of the beer comes from? Uh, no, not necessarily. It can, it does have a role to play in it, uh, but the body will mostly come from the residual sugar content that's in the beer, the alcohol content that's in the beer, the effervescence of the beer is very important to the body. Uh, I mean, even to the degree where it can make a beer taste, taste much lighter in alcohol or much heavier in alcohol. Uh, if you had a beer that was 9% alcohol that had a bunch of CO2 in it, you would think that it's maybe 7% in alcohol. So a lot of the body comes from those characteristics there can be some body that comes from less filtration or more filtration, but usually that's not good. If you're picking up body qualities from not filtering, it's usually a chalky quality because you have too much particulate that's left over in there. So there's a lot of those, be like the beers now, uh, a day is like the hazy IPAs and things like that. Um, you know, some of those uh, are coming from the mineral content in the water and its interaction with the yeast and things like that. But if you're getting it because you're just leaving a bunch of sludge in the beer, then that's not a good way to do it. And it's not a, a good representation of the beer afterwards. And it also really hurts shelf life quite a bit. So it's perfectly fine to unfilter your beer completely, but all you have to, it's really hard to make a super cloudy beer uh, on purpose because if you just let it sit in the tank for a couple days, it really just settles out by itself and it becomes a relatively clear beer after that. So uh, you gotta really go out of your way to make a very muddy, sludgy beer. Uh, and if you're doing it the right way, it can add some, uh, what it will do is just not take away any of the aromas. So really those beers that are like the hazy, murky IPAs or whatever you wanna call them, 
Uh, they are beers that have low bitterness and high dry hop qualities and are not filtered very much. And um, that's it. Okay, any other questions about the brewing process? Yes? Yeah, good question. The, the question was, when do they add spices to the beers? Uh, you mentioned cilantro, but usually you'll see things like orange peel and um, you know, grains of paradise and things like that. Uh, most of those are added in the Whirlpool edition, or you can add them post-fermentation, similar to dry hopping. And the reason why you do them a different way is because if basically if they're aseptic or not. So if you have it, ar if it's already aseptic and it has no bacterial contamination, you can add it in post-fermentation. But if you're gonna add something in post-fermentation that hasn't been sterilized already, then you have the chance of bacterial contamination, which is why you wouldn't do that. Uh, and that's when you'd add it into the whirlpool side because it'll sterilize the ingredients that you're using. But if they're delicate ingredients, they could also not get the flavors that you want out of it because of that. Yeah, good question. Uh, the question was, how do you control the yeast of a wild beer? And the answer is, uh, pretty much you don't. Uh, you can control it with the amount that you pitch, and you can control it with the sugar content, you can control it with the temperature, just like you would any other yeast, but it's, it can be difficult to control, and they do kind of have a mind of their own at times. It's not as difficult as working with bacteria, um, especially pediococcus, but like lactobacillus delbrecki that you'll see in a lot of um, kettle soured beers and a lot of just most sour beers in general use lactobacillus delbrecki. That is fairly easy to control, but I would say that it's a sliding scale of, or that the scale ramps up in volume from uh, like Britannomyces, that wild yeast strain would be here and then it would be uh, lactobacillus, and then it would be pediococcus after that. Those get much more difficult as you go up in, into the bacteria phase of things, uh, especially because they interact with each other and the other ingredients in the beer, and they're just overall a real pain in the ass. Okay. Any other questions? How come sterilization is not a problem when you do the dry hop thing? You're talking about throwing other random things in the hop. How come throwing a bunch of hops in doesn't? Yeah, good question. The question was, how come throwing a bunch of hops in post-fermentation doesn't cause a bunch of trouble? Um, the hops are already fairly sterilized, and they also have antimicrobial and antibacterial qualities to them. And they were actually originally used in beer for that specific quality. Actually, even today, uh, Lambic-style beers, which are naturally, spontaneously fermented beers from the Lambic region of Belgium, uh, which are very rare and hard to find and taste really weird and funky, and they have tons of different wild yeasts and bacteria in them. They don't have any hints of uh, West Coast style hop profiles to them. They use tons of hops in their beer, but they're all aged hops. So they just let them sit out and then all the acids and oils get out of them and they only use them for preservative qualities. Other questions? Okay. Sensory evaluation, what we all want to talk about. So we're basically gonna go through the uh, whole sensory part for everybody that's watching, and then we're going to break from the presentation and go drink beer after that. I hope that works for everybody. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so sensory evaluation. Before we get started, the reason why I think that this is very important is because we all drink beer, and we all drink stuff and eat stuff in general, right? And I really want, I think that there's a severe lack of good vocabulary out there when talking about these types of things that we ingest. And a lot of times I hear things like, good, bad, gross, I don't like it, stuff like that. All stuff that sounds really dumb. So we're going to try to not sound really dumb, and I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of fun descriptors, and I really wanna teach everybody in the room that it is, uh, it, it's very easy to describe things if you think about them critically, almost regardless of 
your uh, background. Now, it does help, there is a caveat, it does help if you're an adventurous person who likes to travel, who, uh, you know, not a picky eater, not a picky drinker, things like that, because you'll just have more life experiences and more descriptors to pull from. Uh, if you're somebody who only eats hamburgers and french fries and you get it plain every time or you order something a specific way and that's the only thing you eat forever for your whole life, you always get a Caesar salad with the sauce on the side and the croutons, there's only three of them placed on the right side of the plate and things like that. If you're that kind of a person, it is harder to do, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. And a lot of the descriptors will actually come from just the environment of you walking around and smelling your environment and noticing your environment, be it trees or ground or rain or all these kind of senses uh, that come to you. Um, and it, they're especially from an aromatic standpoint, you learn that that's a very important part of it. So, but the idea is that a lot of people think, especially from a wine world, has anybody done a wine tasting in here before? Okay, so especially like from the wine side of things, I think that they really like to pull out the flavor wheel and use a lot of terminology that you would only use if you were talking to industry professionals about wine. And I think that's completely useless unless you are an industry professional about wine. So. I like to teach sensory to the public from the sense that it, they're all descriptors that we all know that we can all talk about because it makes sense and it's more relevant if you're out having dinner with someone or you're out at a bar with your friends. These are all words that we would use all the time and totally know exactly what they mean without saying you know, something weird that would only be used for specific scientific purpose that's only inside of the brew house. No point in saying something like that, right? So that's the idea. So what I'm gonna walk you through is really the uh, structure of how I like to taste beer, how I like to break it down. And if you, we're gonna do a very kind of regimented version of this tasting, but it doesn't mean that you have to crack out a pen and paper every single time that you taste something or eat something or you're out at dinner. What it means is just to think about things in this manner and you will have a better and easier way of describing them, which makes you a better consumer ultimately and just more educated in general about the things that you ingest, right? Okay, so first thing is going to be the appearance of the beer. So we want to think of colors like golden, amber. Uh, we want to avoid using the terms light and dark because they're really junky descriptors. So think of the, a Crayola box, think of the rainbow, think of colors of things that you see out in the world, and those are more fun descriptors. And also keep in mind, whenever you're making these descriptors, the more, um, I call them the prime number of the explanation, which means keep digging down until it's the last thing that you could think of in that explanation. So for example, if you say hoppy, the reason why I don't like saying hoppy is because what kind of hops are you talking about? And when in the brewing process did you use them? And are you talking about bitterness or flavor or aroma? Right? There's a litany of things that we could talk about. If we say hoppy, it's such a loaded descriptor. So what I really would rather have you say is it smells like standing in a wet forest or it smells like a freshly grated lime zest. That is a prime uh, descriptor right there. That is, you are digging down to the furthest that you could go. So you can replace hoppy with that kind of a thing. And the same thing goes with citrus, the same thing goes with floral, and it's the same reason why saying good, bad, light, and dark all suck. Because they're not good descriptors of things because they're way more detailed and better descriptors of them. Okay, so think of your creative writing class out there. You're all creative people. Make it happen. Uh, head retention will be another one. So this will just be how long the head stays on the beer. So I'll pour a little bit of beer here so you can see what I'm talking about. So we see that there is a nice fluffy white head on the beer. Also, just quickly, head is part of beer. So if you ever like put your finger in here or you blow it off or knock it off or something like that, stop doing that. That's, it's part of the beer, you drink it, okay? Uh, so we see how long this sticks around on there. That is our head retention. So we say it's a fluffy, bright white head that dissipated about halfway quickly and the rest of it stuck around. Okay, great, perfect. Next will be the clarity of the beer. Uh, this beer, for example, has a slight haze to it, right? Not crystal clear, it's got a little haziness. 
And we just want to mention something along those lines. Is it bright? Is it crisp? Is it clear? Is it opaque in color? Is it hazy but light in color? All of those things, okay? The next part is the aroma. This is where I want you to spend the majority of your time evaluating the aroma. So there's a couple different parts of our olfactory system. There is, what, what do you think of, what part of your body do you think of when you think of aroma? Think of your nose, right? Pretty obvious. But the fact of the matter is that you have an orthonasal and a retronasal. Your orthonasal is your nose, and that's where you get some aroma from. And your retronasal is in the back of your throat that's connected to your nose, and, or your nasal cavity, really. And that's where you get a bunch of aroma from, too. So a lot of times, what we think of as humans, and some people may have been taught this in school, too, that when you smell something, you smell it with your nose, and when you put something in your mouth, it becomes a taste, right? Well, that's not the way that it works at all. You're evaluating the taste and the aroma at the same time when you have something in your mouth. You just don't know it. And the easiest way to describe this to you would be any time that you've ever been sick before and had a stuffed up nose, and have you ever said, man, I can't taste anything, right? We've all said that. Everyone shake their head, damn it. We've all <laughs> said that before in our lives, right? Okay. That's because our retronasal is closed at that time. So we're not getting a bunch of aroma. It's not that we can't taste things. Our taste buds still work fine. It's just that we can only taste five or six things, and we can smell thousands and thousands and thousands of things, right? So from a percentage standpoint, can someone figure out what, what's the percentage of five versus 10,000? Okay, whatever that is, is the amount of time that you should spend on aroma versus taste. All right. And I'll look for that answer later. Thank you. Uh, we want to take short, concise breaths as we're doing this evaluation. So if anybody's ever taught you to smell something before, uh, for the wine class, how do they teach you how to smell wine? Come on, guys. You took a wine class. How many? OK, you've been out with a friend before that's done this before. How do people smell wine? Good. Yeah, what kind of breath do they take usually? Yeah, big, giant, deep one, right? Yeah. Doesn't that look badass? No, you look stupid. So the reason why we don't do that is the same reason why dogs don't take big, giant breaths in, and they take little, tiny, short breaths in. It's because it dries out your nasal cavity, so it's no good for evaluating things. So when we take breaths of things in to evaluate the orthonasal portion of it, we want to take small, short breaths, just like a dog would. So I like to smell it, pull it away, smell it, pull it away, smell it, pull it away, and keep going until I get everything that I can out of it. Swirling will help agitate and um, volatize the aromas that are in the glass. So if you're having trouble, because we're using these little glasses as we're going to taste. So at home, if you're doing this, you want to use the biggest, most open, you know, big wine glass, stem glass. I should mention that while we're talking about aroma. The glass for beer that you've all seen out there, for some reason we got the shitty glass out of all the different types of liquor in, in the world. Uh, the beer glass, the worst glass in the world. So just throw all your beer glasses in the trash can and go buy wine glasses. They're way better for evaluating beer and just really drinking out of in general. They, they're just better. So if you need to have water glasses at your house, keep those pint glasses in your cupboard and you can do that. And all the rest of them you can throw off your balcony and call it a day. And then go buy wine glasses and pour all the stuff inside of those, okay? And then you swirl that around and smell those. That's really what you want to do, okay? Uh, next, talk about that. 10,000 different aromas, look, exclamation mark. Uh, take your time. So please, this is the time that I need you to focus on the most, the most important. You should have lots of words written for this portion of it, okay? The other ones would be very short. When you talk about the, the appearance of the beer, when you're talking about the taste and aftertaste and all those things, but the aroma should, this is where your creative writing really comes into play, okay? Uh, think of the food, environment, memories was something that we didn't talk about. Uh, if you, like, let's say you had an orange tree in your front yard when you were a kid and this reminds you of being at home. For me, I had a pepper tree in my front yard, so anytime I have things with peppercorns, peppercorn sauces, you know, peppercorn sauce on a steak, salad, whatever it may be, beers that have it, it reminds me of being at home. 
because I had a big pepper tree in my front yard. So you can associate those uh, kind of memories of, you know, maybe you walked by a rose bush every day from your grandma's house when you went to school. So the beer reminds you of being at grandma's house and going to school. That's cool. All right, taste is the next part. So this is where people get very confused. Taste is the portion of your tongue and all the receptors around your cheeks and whatnot. And you can only evaluate, you can only detect a very small amount of qualities from taste. Here they are. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami. And then if it's none of these, it's an aroma. Okay, so a lot of times, matter of fact, every single time I've done this class, which is probably 150 times, there's always been one person, at the very least, who's written an aroma in the taste section. Don't be that person. You can be my first class who doesn't do that. <laughs> I'll be so happy. Uh, and it's very hard to do because, like I said, we're all taught to when we take a sip of something, it becomes the taste immediately. So you think, as soon as you put the beer into your mouth, everything that you can think of in your brain at that point becomes taste. This is not true. Because if it's not one of those things, it's not a taste. That's it, period. So does that mean that you only describe it as sweet, sour, salty, umami, bitter? No, it doesn't. It means be creative, have fun. You know, you still want some creative uh, input on this. And what I like to do is use one qualitative and one quantitative descriptor in front of a taste. So what I mean by that is you give a level of, um, of whatever the, the quality is. Like, let's say it's bitter, for example. So I would say a qualitative example, like pine, and a quantitative example, like high, aggressive, moderate, low, medium, and then say the taste descriptor, bitter. So it has a piney, aggressive bitterness. It has a moderate caramel sweetness. Something like that. Make sense? OK. Next, aftertaste and mouthfeel. So here, we're going to be judging uh, whatever we are detecting in our mouths. So the viscosity of the beer, how thick is the beer? Is it like a, um, you know, like a brandy? Is it coating your mouth? Or is it like a champagne that wafts away very quickly and is very effervescent and bubbly? Uh, the effervescence is a big part of it. We talked about that earlier. Uh, if it's a high, highly effervescent beer, it will seem much more lighter on your palate. Uh, lingering flavors, any bitterness, any sweetness, any roastiness that li lingers around, mention it here in the aftertaste and the mouthfeel. And that's it. The cheers. Okay, any more questions before we start tasting? Yes? Why is beer so warm in Germany? I'm sorry? In, Germ in Germany, beers are so warm. Warm? Warm. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, the question was, why are the beers so warm in Germany? So first of all, the beers should not be warm in Germany. So you probably didn't have very good beer over there. Uh, the beer in Europe sometimes can be served at cellar temperature, which is 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So it depends on how you drink beer. But sometimes we are sort of um, maybe programmed, if you will, to drink beer at a very cold temperature, maybe because of some one brewery who makes commercials about <laughs> trains and ice mountains. But other than that, you should not be drinking beer at super cold temperatures. Uh, and the reason why is because all those aromas, they do not come out into the air uh, at cold temperatures, so or into your mouth for that matter or into your nasal cavity. So when you drink beer, it should be at that 50 to 55 degree range, especially if you're evaluating it. I mean, there's a certain thing to be said about preference. Like if you love your beer super ice cold, then whatever, drink it super ice cold. But just know that you're not getting as much flavor and aroma out of it as if you drank it a few degrees warmer. So as a rule of thumb, usually in a, I like it at about 45 degrees or so. Uh, if I'm really like diving in and judging beer or something, I, um, we almost always have it at 50, 55 degrees. Um, there you go. What else? Ready to drink beer? Yeah. Okay, peace.